We uh, have nurses on our panel, physical therapists. We have an anesthesia pain specialist, uh, as well as um, medical providers like myself uh, and uh, other advanced practice providers. Um, we have social workers, psychologists, uh, and researchers uh, who are all involved in this uh, group together. And that, the idea is to, to be able to bring together our different backgrounds and experiences so that we can each lend our uh, individual perspectives to our um, discussions around pain and how it affects the bleeding disorders community. Uh, and then it allows us to um, uh, come together and generate uh, expert consensus-based guidance documents like the one we'll be reviewing. Next slide. So the goal of this pain initiative, uh, when Dr. Pipe, who is the chair of MASAC, um, started our group several years ago, uh, is really to reduce the negative impact of pain in the lives of any members of the bleeding disorders community. And as we work toward that goal and have been working toward that goal for several years, uh, one of the ways that we aim to do that is to educate the community about pain um, uh, so that we can uh, in effect get the word out uh, and make sure that uh, we are hearing um, from those of you who are affected by pain and, and also that we are communicating uh, what you've told us and what we know and think uh, to the rest of the community, to the providers in the bleeding disorders community um, so that ultimately we can uh, uh, reduce the impact of pain. Next slide. So one of the first uh, documents that we have uh, issued from our group uh, is this opioid guidance document, which is shorthand. You'll see the, the, the longer name here in just a second. Um, but we, we made this document for uh, a couple of different reasons. The kind of overarching uh, theme here is that pain management, uh, as, as anyone on the call today will appreciate is quite challenging uh, and complex endeavor uh, from all sides, from the provider side, from the patient side. Um, and uh, because of that, the guidelines that have been issued by various groups over the years uh, are quite complex. Uh, and it is difficult uh, to say the least uh, for a clinic that has historically been focused on taking care of people with bleeding disorders, uh, mainly focused on prevention and treatment of bleeding, to suddenly incorporate a very complex uh, chronic pain management program. And so uh, we are, are starting for this document from the CDC's uh, guidelines for prescribing opioids for chronic pain. Uh, and we are uh, addressing two main um, uh, uh, areas. The first is to provide some practical guidance for our clinics, like at hemophilia treatment centers. Um, we're we're uh, starting with uh, the CDC's 123-page document and trying to digest it down into what we hope is useful information uh, for our clinics and clinic providers. And then we also highlight any concerns with the current guidelines from the CDC that are specific to individuals with bleeding disorders um, and uh, uh, attaining consensus um, from all of our experts involved uh, on the task force. Um, a, a very kind of straightforward example of this would be uh, the guidelines uh, certainly endorse the use of uh, non-steroidal anti-inflammatory medications, uh, NSAIDs like ibuprofen, uh, and that is generally avoided in individuals with bleeding disorders. And so we, we point that out um, uh, uh, just as an example of, of one of those bleeding disorder specific concerns. Next slide. 
So this, uh, for your reference, is a, is a link uh, to the document itself. You can look at it uh, in PDF form um, all you like. It has been uh, published and approved by the, the board of NHF um, and can be found at this website. You can just uh, Google uh, MASAC pain and it's the first or second link that comes up. Um, but there it is. It is quite an exciting read. Uh, we could go to the next slide. So some examples of the content. Uh, this is a, a bit paraphrased. Uh, so if you if you want the original, look at the document itself. But just to give you a sense of, of what this addressed is, and this uh, in no way is meant to cover everything about chronic pain, of course, but really just focused on opioids for, uh, for chronic pain management. Um, and so some of our guidance or some of our recommendations include, uh, number one, uh, that all patients should be asked about pain um, and that we should also be assessing symptoms of uh, depression and anxiety. Uh, second, opioids uh, should be prescribed only if non-opioid treatments are insufficient um, so that uh, you know, non-opioid, non-pharmacologic uh, pain um, management strategies are preferred um, uh, when that is possible. Um, for anyone who is undergoing pain treatments, uh, we need to establish realistic treatment goals for both pain as well as functioning. Um, and we establish those goals and then follow them over time to see if we're helping. Uh, and then a, another uh, recommendation that is included is to, to not continue opioids if uh, it's determined that the benefits are outweighed by the risks of these medications. <clears throat> Next slide. We also, uh, so that you're aware, you'll see this in the document if you review it, that uh, we also provide a, a, an example worksheet that clinics can use uh, to help uh, kind of organize their visits uh, with uh, respect to um, uh, pain, uh, pain assessment, pain management. Uh, this is something that I've used in my clinics for a long time uh, and, and kind of helps keep me on track and, and helps us remember what we've discussed in the past. And this is just part of uh, that worksheet. And you can see that, you know, the things we're interested in are hearing about how pain impacts someone in their own words, um, you know, what are the goals that, that we want to set um, for treatment? Um, you know, we ask about where pain is located um, and how that impacts your function. Uh, and then the sheet goes on. So it's, uh, it, it's hopefully something that uh, gives some practical um, tools, uh, again, to our clinics. And next slide. And this is the, the, my final slide and, and, you know, really in talking to different group members, um, uh, we wanted to be sure that we, we uh, leave with a final message that, you know, we recognize that there is a, a strong push um, from multiple fronts to minimize uh, opioid use, uh, you know, in this country in general. Um, and there are a lot of reasons for that. Um, uh, and uh, the fact that we are issuing this document is, is an opportunity for us to say, we uh, recognize and agree with those efforts. Um, however, we also recognize that in some cases, opioids are still appropriate uh, and, and are actually uh, effective treatments for pain. Um, if uh, opioids are used, though, they, they definitely need to be used responsibly. Um, we, have, we have to monitor uh, the effectiveness of these medications uh, and, one, to know if they're working and to be able to tell if there are benefits to using them. Um, that, that's something that's required um, by regulatory agencies uh, that we do that. We also need to monitor very carefully for safety, uh, and that's really to ensure that we're not doing harm um, to anyone who, uh, whose pain we're addressing. Um, 
and in large part, even though it's a lot of logistical work uh, and a lot of um, time on the part of patients, you know, we do uh, recommend and, and fully agree with complying with the, the regulatory requirements. And, and that's part of the reason why this is uh, a, a difficult endeavor. Um, and yet we think that those are, are quite important. So, um, you know, opioids um, uh, are, are not going away. They are being uh, minimized in many cases, uh, and they certainly need to be um, monitored carefully and use responsibly. So that is it for me. Thanks, All right, Mr. thank you, Dr. Buckner. Um, with that, we're going to be switching over to Dr. Wheat. And Dr. Emily Wheat is an assistant professor in the Department of Pediatrics at the University of Colorado School of Medicine, as well as a clinical psychologist at the Hemophilia and Thrombosis Center. She specializes in providing mental health interventions and assessments to individuals with comorbid mental health and medical concerns. Before we switch over to Dr. Wheat, um, we would like to ask a couple more questions, again, using um, Menti, uh, www.menti.com, and the code 419741. But just wondering, has your activity level changed during the pandemic? Has it increased, decreased, or no change at all? So from an activity level perspective, and this will help Dr. Weed as she does her um, presentation. Has it increased, decreased, or no change at all? And just remember, if you have any questions for the panel, you can leave them in the Q&A section of um, Zoom, and we will be sure and get to that after the presentation is done. So looks like an equal amount increased a little bit. Okay, we're, we're just uh, toggling back and forth between um, uh, an equal amount of increased and decreased. So 50-50 there and just a little bit of no change. And then the next question is, has your stress level changed during the pandemic? Has that increased, decreased, or no change? And we don't have anybody who's had a lessening of their stress level. So Dr. Wheat, that's a clear message to you there. All right. And, and remember, you can continue answering this um, as you need to. So with that, I'm gonna turn this over to Dr. Wheat. Thank you very much. Great. So today what I'll really be talking about is the um, psychosocial aspects of pain um, and really just sort of setting the stage and the context around why considering psychosocial factors um, when discussing pain might be important. So the first piece that I really want to talk about is this idea of a mind-body connection. Um, and what I mean by that is that the way that we think the way that we feel, um, the way that we, that we act um, can impact our physical functioning or our physical health. And pain is one indicator of how well we're functioning physically. So with that in mind, um, our beliefs about how well we're able to manage our pain, our perspectives on our pain, the way we feel about our pain, um, and the way that we choose to act in response to that pain can in fact um, impact our um, ability to function with and manage our pain. Um, so another component that goes along with that mind-body connection is this idea of stress. And so I, um, loved seeing that minty quiz. And as I anticipated, yeah, stress looks like it's gone up somewhat um, for the majority of um, individuals who are um, here and participating today. And so stress or stressors can also impact um, what we're thinking, feeling, and the types of ways that we choose to respond. Um, and that can also in turn impact our physical functioning and so impact our, our pain. Um, and on the next slide, you'll see a little bit of information about three different types of stress. Um, so there's uh, acute stress, and this is something that we all 
experience um, in our lives, um, it, it's a brief instance where our um, body may get physiologically activated, so that fight or flight response. So it could be something as minor um, or frustrating as hearing maybe your neighbor's car alarm go off in the middle of the night and it jolts you awake and um, activates, you know, you find your heart speeding and um, that fight or flight has been activated. Um, acute stress could also be something like getting in a car wreck, um, but really just anything that is brief um, in the moment that activates that fight or flight. But those feelings, that racing um, heartbeat or uh, what increased breath, those butterflies in your stomach, sweaty palms, all of those things eventually um, kind of come back to normal. So a second type of stressor is episodic acute. And so this is um, essentially several acute instances of stress that occur um, over a brief period of time. So examples of that might be if you're uh, a student and you're having a difficult two weeks of exams, um, you may continue to have those elevations physiologically related to stress, um, but there is a discrete endpoint those exams, one hopes, will eventually be over and you'll have the opportunity to take um, somewhat of a break before diving back in um, to that, those types of stresses. This could also include things like a difficult work schedule, um, maybe frequent arguments um, with a, a partner or a loved one. Um, and so those are episodic acute. And then chronic types of stressors, um, these are stressors that stick around for a long time. Um, and it can be anything from, gosh, poverty, homelessness, um, racism, but it can also include being in um, something like an abusive relationship. Um, it can include caregiving for someone with um, a longstanding chronic illness, um, managing one yourself. But these are stressors that last um, for quite a while and, you know, really you, you don't get the opportunity um, for your body maybe to ever physiologically come down um, from, from those effects of those stressors. So there are also some, um, so psychologists really think a lot about stress and life events, especially because of the toll that, that these things can take on our health. Um, so there are a couple of different uh, measures that look at big life events and stress and how those may impact us. Um, so a few of those, there's the stressful life events and daily hassle scale, and there's also the Holmes and Rahe stress scale. And on the next slide, I've got a few examples um, of some different life events that one may experience um, that, that may create stress. And if you look at these, some of them are events that you might consider to be somewhat positive. Um, marriage, that's exciting. At the same time, um, these events are all big transitions and so can create some level of, of stress. The reason that I put these up is because um, while some of us may have previously worried less about many of these life events, Perhaps in the context of a global pandemic, um, these are stressors that are coming up more frequently um, or things that may feel like they are more of a reality. So something like a change in, in work or in your spouse's work, major change in social activities. I don't know how many of you are experiencing that at this time. Um, you know, worries about um, changes in health or, you know, health of a loved one, those types of things, um, changes in sleep habits, eating habits may have been, um, you know, things that you were less worried about, but in the midst of um, COVID and some other current events, these types of stressors might um, feel, feel more real in this day and age. And so the American Psychological Association um, has actually looked a little bit at this. Um, they do um, a longitudinal collection of data. So they collect data on stress year after year. And this year um, was, was no different, um, but they were able to collect some specific information about how um, individuals are handling um, stress in the midst of COVID. 
And so just to kind of give you a brief summary of what they found in general, there was a significant increase in average um, stress levels. So similar to what we saw moments ago um, on the, the slide um, where you all answered that, that um, question. Uh, this you know, big survey also found that for individuals who have um, kiddos at home who are under the age of 18, that their stress levels are even higher than those who maybe aren't um, caregiving for, for kids at all or, or have kiddos who are um, 18 or older. And so um, some of the areas around um, stress for those individuals centered on being able to educate their children um, there's perhaps a couple of different hats that parents are wearing now that they may not have been wearing previously, including taking on the role of um, teaching and kind of monitoring that learning process for their kids. And then also just managing basic, basic needs around the house. And then stress related to things like economy and the work has increased and individuals of color and minority status are more likely to report um, higher levels of stress. So that's, that's um, the more serious part of the news. What do we do about it, right? Um, and I don't wanna steal from my next presenter's um, information too much, but what I'll you know, really leave you with is that if you're finding yourself experiencing stress in the midst of this, um, reaching out to your um, HTC mental health care provider. Um, so likely your social worker is a great place to start. And then your local chapter will have some other excellent resources. Um, so I'll leave it there so I don't spoil any of the other information that might um, be coming in, our, in, a, in the next part of our presentation. All right, well, thank you, Dr. Waite. Next, we're going to have the personal perspective for Mr. Sean Jeffrey. Sean is a lifelong community member who's been involved both nationally and internationally. He has many years of experience with camps, educational programs, and leadership initiatives, including NYLI, uh, SURO, and AFFIRM. He currently serves on the MASAC Pain Committee and the Mental Health Working Group as a patient advocate. And so before we um, move on to Sean's presentation, again, a mentee question, have you had any difficulty accessing your pain medications during the COVID-19 pandemic? So if you are taking any type of pain medications, and these don't have to just be opioids, um, but pain medications, have you had any difficulty accessing them? And again, this is an anonymous um, so we can't see who's responding to what question. So we don't have any access to that type of information. Any problems at all? It doesn't look like people, one person maybe, um, but the majority of people aren't taking anything. A few have not had any problems and one person has had some issues. So again, you can continue responding to these questions on your um, smartphone uh, and we'll be able to come back to these. And if you have any questions for the panel, you can put them in the Q&A um, spot on your Zoom and we'll be getting to them as soon as Sean is done. So now I'll turn this over to Sean. Great. Thanks, Michelle. I appreciate it. Mm -hmm. um, so I kind of wanted to just talk about some anecdotal experiences, you know, that I personally have had. And also I've talked to some other friends and others in the community um, and kind of seeing what they're dealing with, with pain and also during um, COVID, uh, just how they've been kind of handling different stresses. Um, I think one of the most uh, important stresses or common ones that we all have typically is having access to factor and our prescriptions. Um, as the previous slide talked about, it showed that a lot of people haven't really had uh, access problems, which is great. And that's actually, I haven't had any problems and talking to my friends, I haven't seen them have any issues either. Um, so that is really good news. Um, if you do have any issues though, or access problems, talking to your HTC um, is extremely important. Uh, like Emily said, your mental health People there, like your social worker, um, is probably the best person to start with, and they can connect you with resources through different um, companies or programs or things like that. Um, myself, I do have co, co 
pay assistance programs, um, and they've been really helpful for me. Um, other prescriptions that you might be taking non-fact related, uh, you can also talk to your HTC staff. Uh, a lot of the time they can help provide information as well as, um, you know, do you really need to be taking certain pain medications or other medications? And they can also contact your other providers and kind of work together as a group and a team to give you the best care that you can. Um, and a lot of us during COVID uh, have been less active. And so what does that look like for factory use and pain med use? Um, me personally, I'm on on demand and I do have a target ankle and left elbow um, as my biggest issues, um, but being less active, um, I haven't been using factor as much. So I've actually personally switched on demand um, where I was prophylactic beforehand. Um, that's kind of a conversation I've had with myself and other care providers. Um, so just make sure you talk to your HCC and get the best information you can. Uh, next slide. One thing that people have talked about uh, with friends and myself, uh, less accessibility to um, actually talk to your staff in person and work with them. Um, annual visits, I know many of them typically happen around the summer. Uh, a lot of that is based off of camp kind of. And with, I think, many states not doing camps, uh, people need to make sure they're still in contact with their HCC and their providers, uh, making sure they still have uh, up-to-date prescriptions and getting those annual visits, uh, making sure they're still in contact. Um, physical therapy, a lot of the time right now, can be limited, um, and that can be a very important part of um, patients' health and things like that. Um, Thank you for the question, George. Uh, so I am a severe A hemophiliac. Probably should have said that earlier on. Um, but yeah, so I'm a severe A and have been the whole time. Um, not feeling as connected to your team. Uh, you know, a lot of us do see our HCC staff very frequently and not being able to talk to them in person and as often can be stressful. Um, so even if we're not able to go in person and physically talk to them and, you know, hug and do all those fun things. I think a phone call or a Zoom call or, you know, depending on if your center has telehealth set up, uh, that could be another way to contact and feel connected. Um, and talking about telehealth, I don't know if all centers have access to this, but I know with COVID, this has been kind of a priority for a lot of centers to kind of get up and running because um, this has been the best way for people to access um, their medical needs and team. Uh, for some folks, this may actually make access a lot more convenient. Uh, myself, I used to live in Colorado uh, near the HTC Center, so that was easy to just, you know, take a drive and talk to them, but now I'm in Montana. Uh, luckily, Colorado still sees the patients in Montana, but I can no longer, I'm not going to take an eight-hour drive, you know, for fun to come see people. So being able to have a Zoom call, have a phone call, um, you know, use telehealth to talk to my providers um, has been really beneficial. Um, being in Montana, a lot of the state is rural, and so if you do live in an area that doesn't have a close HTC, telehealth can be really useful and allow you to interact with your providers a lot more frequently. Um, connectivity and equipment, um, those are some things that can be difficult with telehealth. Uh, obviously, you need internet access. The center needs to be set up with it. You need to have a you know, computer and potentially microphone and video at home uh, so you can access. So those are some barriers, um, but I know you can potentially get access or, you know, maybe go to a friend's house or talk to someone who has that equipment um, if you need to do so um, to get access. Next slide. So during COVID, I think everybody's stress, as we saw on that question slide, has gone up greatly. Um, for most folks. Um, and staying healthy is a great way to try to combat that and keep our stress levels down or at least in a decent um, realm. Uh, one thing I've talked to a lot of people, how are they handling the stress with COVID and stuff like that. Uh, cooking has been a very big thing that I know a lot of people have been kind of taking up, trying out new recipes. If you haven't really cooked beforehand, um, you're kind of learning. Uh, how to do so, whether it's successful or not. It's a good skill to try to test yourself and learn new recipes. 
Uh, one thing with food as well, I know another way for mental health uh, is you can kind of get takeout um, or things like that from local uh, restaurants and businesses uh, to help support your local community. Uh, so kind of finding a balance with that is a good thing. Probably the, the thing that I've heard from most in the community and my friends that people have taken up is meditation. I think with all of the downtime we've had during COVID, it has allowed us to take a step back and kind of think about what's important to us, uh, who's important to us. You know, a lot of us can get, kind of get stuck in a grind with work and just do the typical nine to five and just kind of go through the motions. And I think meditating and doing some self-awareness and taking a step back and thinking about things can really help identify the positive aspects of our life and things to look at and maybe use some negative things that we can try to get rid of. Um, reading education has also been an improvement that people I've heard have been you know, doing more so. There's a lot of online classes that are being used through universities or other organizations. Um, books, I know a lot of people have been using libraries and things like that. There's a lot of online resources you can do, whether it's renting a book through a Kindle or something like that, or getting an audio book um, and listening to that. Um, podcasts are also a great way to get educational resources. Um, and then fitness, it seemed like with that question, we had a decent balance of folks. Some fitness decreased, some have increased. You know, we haven't been going out. A lot of people do like group um, activities and fitness courses. And so those haven't been able to be done in person um, for many of us. And so going online and having a, you know, a teacher or something like that, or a personal trainer, um, giving a class that you can attend and work out in your home is very helpful. Um, some folks do still go outside, you know, going on hikes and things like that. It might just not be you know, with the same group that you did. Um, but staying in shape, I think for the bleeding disorder community can be very important. Um, some of us not being as active has probably reduced some of our pain uh, from, you know, constant nagging joints or things like that. Then others, um, if we don't move around enough or, you know, are active, we can get kind of stiff and pain can increase. So finding a good balance of fitness is very important. And then I think, you know, all of us in this community, or most of us at least, really enjoy our time spending it with friends and family and others in the bleeding disorder community. And that has been greatly limited with COVID. Um, different states have different regulations with opening and reopening and things like that. So make sure you listen to those regulations and try to abide by them to keep uh, everybody and yourself as safe as you can. But staying in touch is still important. Um, you know, doing an online hangout uh, through Zoom or other or other uh, businesses and things like that apps um, can be really helpful. Uh, people, they still get together. Um, I've seen a lot of, when I've walked my dog, I've seen a lot of people in front yards with chairs left out uh, six feet apart, you know, following protocols and things like that. But it shows that people are still getting together and trying to have community, um, even if we can't hug each other, shake hands, um, and things like that. And then one thing that I have uh, really appreciated is movie nights. Um, I used to do this uh, through college and with friends all the time, but, you know, trying to sync up two different movies, you know, countdown, one, two, three, start can be difficult um, having conversation with that. Uh, one app that I've used is called Netflix Party, and that actually allows a bunch of people to sign in. And you kind of have a side chat that you can talk to each other through while watching a movie. And only one person in the group uh, has the ability to control the movie. So um, if people need to get up and go, you know, use the restroom or get, make more popcorn and things like that, they can do so. And you can just uh, let that person know and they can pause the movie so people aren't um, off sync. Um, so those, you know, are just a few things that people do for self-care. Um, but as my picture on the slide says, self-care isn't selfish. There's a lot going on, trying to support our communities in a lot of different ways. Sometimes that can be exhausting and cause burnout. So trying to find a good balance of taking care of yourself and taking care of others um, is a good thing to do. Next slide. And these are just some resources I have, uh, you know, a very small amount of resources. There's a lot of them out there. Um, coronavirus.gov, that talks about a lot of different um, things going on with coronavirus. You can get to your state uh, organizations and websites through that as well. 
Um, you know, for a lot of parents at home, I know teaching and things like that um, have been difficult and trying to come up with some activities uh, has also been difficult. And I think uh, these resources have been helpful for, you know, crafts, arts and crafts, things like that. Um, the library resource, it talks about different um, kind of drawing and painting and coloring uh, things through different libraries and museums throughout the world. Um, so that's really cool. Um, home workouts, uh, the World Health Organization has a lot of different home uh, workouts that are available um, that they really kind of renovated and updated during COVID. Um, so that's a great place to go for those. And then some really cool things that I saw were virtual tours. Uh, San Diego Zoo and a few other zoos are doing virtual tours. Um, I love zoos and aquariums. And so using those, people will have cameras that kind of highlight specific um, animals that they're talking about, or it kind of just goes through and shows what the zoo is going on and things like that. And then uh, the other one with museums, uh, it's similar to the zoo one, but people are highlighting different aspects and different uh, art pieces that are in museums and things like that. And so if that's more your style, uh, you can utilize that. Um, but yeah, uh, with these are kind of the resources I grabbed, but there are tons and tons of them out there. So I encourage everybody to reach out um, to your HGC, other friends and family, other people in the community and kind of see what everybody's up to. Um, and just try to find ways to stay positive and stay healthy during this time. Thank you, Sean. That was excellent. Uh, so appreciated. So real quickly, um, before we go to Q&A, and you can certainly put them in the Q&A box or in the chat box, but just on your phone, uh, you can write in the word, but how are you feeling today? You can put in up to three responses, whatever you want to put in, um, feel free. And it makes this word cloud, which is um, really nice to, to be able to see how people across the country are feeling this afternoon, this Friday afternoon, before going into the weekend. Um, and definitely we all should be grateful. We're grateful that we're, you're here and we're grateful um, to, to be here. So um, we do have a, a few questions. And while this is building, I think that I'll let it sit here for a second and um, ask uh, some of the questions of the uh, speakers. The first one, I, prob I think probably Dr. Buckner would go to you. How can patients use the MASAC guidelines and should I give them to my physician? <clears throat> That's a great question. I think one that uh, we've asked ourselves uh, how that might be helpful. I think, you know, information is, uh, is power. Uh, I think it, it helps to be informed, um, to be to understand, you know, a little bit of what you're up against. So, in a way, if you can, if you can manage to get through the, the guideline or the guidance document that we created, it is, <clears throat> uh, it, it has a few guidance or recommendations that are um, from our group specifically, but all the others uh, are are direct copies of uh, uh, the CDC guidelines and, and it includes all of them. So we address each of those uh, aspects of pain management that are, that are in the uh, CDC's opioid guidelines, again, which is a, a quite a long document that goes through all the evidence that supports those recommendations. Uh, and so I think just being aware and, and, and knowing what um, uh, uh, the guidelines say is step one. The second thing, the question of whether to provide them to your provider, I would, you know, highly encourage you to do so or to point them to the uh, to the document. Um, you know, let them know that uh, the uh, it's not just a um, set of recommendations, but also comes with uh, a worksheet that they can at least look at and see if they think it's uh, useful, um, as well as other links uh, to um, both assessment tools and some other resources that we thought were worth including uh, in the document as well. Uh, you know, really one of the, the big um, 
questions and one of the, the challenges we're faced with is how to get word, the word out um, about these kinds of efforts. How do we make our uh, hemophilia treatment centers and, and really any, um, any clinics who take care of people with bleeding disorders, how do we make them aware that, uh, uh, that these guidance documents exist? And so any, any help you can give toward that, uh, we would appreciate. And I, and I would wager that any of your healthcare providers would also appreciate uh, you know, being pointed uh, toward these resources. And, and the resources will grow. We are, are working very hard on a number of other uh, documents Oh, I, there we go. Hear me? Okay, I got a phone call, so I had to just decline it. Um, it. Other documents are coming to help round out the other types or aspects of pain management, like physical therapy and non-medication management, et cetera. Uh, and so th those will uh, uh, be coming out in the future. And so the more that people know about it, the better, I would say. Great, thank you. And um, as we're building this Zoom or this uh, word cloud, I have to say, whoever put in Zoomed out and Zoom fatigue, I feel your pain. I feel <laughs> your pain. Um, another question, what do you think about cannabis to control pain? And I'll put that out to anyone on the panel. Um, for me personally, uh, when I did live in Colorado, uh, where it was, it's legal medically and recreationally. Um, I have used it and it has been helpful. Um, I know talking to some others in the community, uh, they, they'd agree it has been um, helpful um, for them as well. I think that's really, you know, obviously a really personal decision though. And I think talking to your, your HTC and your medical team um, and your other, met, other folks outside your HTC um, should have that conversation beforehand. Um, but Personally and anecdotally, um, I think it, it can be useful and helpful. And I have to say that I, um, I do a lot of talks on medical marijuana, medical cannabis. And um, in going around and talking to people, I hear the same thing, Sean, that um, there are a lot of people who derive a lot of benefit from it, whether it is for pain or for other reasons. Um, then there are people who have used it and don't find any benefit at all. I think it's really important that you understand the um, pros and cons because like any medication, there are potential side effects and you need to understand what those potential side effects are. Now, of course, they are not as severe as opioids, um, but there are some and so you should understand what they are. And you should understand how to um, start this medication. You should look at it as a medication and um, understand how to start it and how have a plan to not to stop it um, if it's not working for you. And then also, um, as Sean said, having that conversation with um, your medical providers to understand if there's any potential interaction with other medications that you're ta taking. And the, also the other um, legal complications or um, consequences that um, you might face. Although it is legal um, both recreationally and medicinally in many states, it still remains illegal at the federal level. And so there can be many implications for people um, if they are found to be using it. If you're a federal employee, it can have legal implications for you, even if it's legal in your state. Those federal implications can um, have a negative impact on you. So you have to understand those things if you're going to use it. Um, uh, and also from a work perspective, you have to understand um, your work policy. So you know, it may be positive for you, it might not, but understand all of that, that whole um, umbrella of how it might affect you from both a physical perspective, as well as a social and psychological <clears throat> perspective. Did anybody else have anything to add there? 
I, I can jump in. I, I, you know, this, this is an interesting and very common question that, that we get, uh, those of us who, who talk to folks about pain. Um, you know, I would only add, I agree with what's been said. I, I, would, I would add that the, um, you know, from a medical standpoint, there's very, the, the research that supports whether this works or not and how safe it is, it, is pretty limited. And a lot of that has to do with historically that this is, has not been legal and it's certainly never been legal at the federal level. So it's, you know, in general been difficult to get funding for those kinds of research studies. So there, the, what we do have uh, shows that in certain conditions and in certain people, um, you know, cannabis and cannabinoids, uh, which are marijuana derivatives, can, can, can be helpful. I, I think that's true. I know that's true. I have patients who certainly benefit. Um, I think you, you kind of have to, if you're thinking about this, you really um, should, should put on your skeptic hat and, and, and question everything. Uh, you know, it, most importantly, is this working? Is this doing what I needed to do? Is this causing me any problems? But, but even at the level of, you know, in Colorado where this is uh, legal and there's a dispensary, you know, in Denver, kind of around every corner, um, you do kind of have to ask is, is what they're selling me, what they say it is, is it doing what it's supposed to do, um, uh, et cetera. So, you know, I've had, I've had, uh, I, I have many patients that use many different forms of cannabinoids, whether it's inhaled, ingested, topical, uh, there are many different, um, approaches and, and, uh, people tend to find what works and then abandon, you know, things if it doesn't work because it is expensive and not worth wasting your, your time and money on. I, the, oh, the last thing I would point out is that I do recommend being very cautious and, and even avoiding um, cannabinoids. Um, you know, if you have uncontrolled and unmanaged or untreated mental health issues, um, those are situations that I worry a lot about. So uncontrolled depression or anxiety um, uh, sometimes can be made worse um, uh, by these uh, um, uh, medications and, and products. Um, and then I also uh, discourage anyone under the age of 25 uh, from using marijuana because it, uh, it, it, uh, we worry that it interferes with brain development and, and the brain uh, isn't really kind of settled in and fully de developed until your mid-20s, particularly for men. Uh, and so I, I, I do not point any of my teenage or even uh, early 20 year olds um, toward marijuana as an option because it, it, it may affect long term cognitive um, abilities and, and we don't want that. There are other alternatives. Okay, thank you. Um, another question, when is chronic pain a consequence of an unmet medical need, uh, such as lack of insurance, health insurance, to cover a needed medical procedure? Hmm. I don't know that we know that. Yeah, I mean, in terms of how often, I don't know how often that happens, but we definitely see it, you know, we have, have uh, I think historically and, and into the present day, seeing that, you know, our orthopedic surgery colleagues um, often are able to offer uh, a solution to chronic pain with different surgical procedures, whether it's, a, you know, a joint injection or even a joint replacement. Um, we don't aim uh, to get to that point. We don't want to get to the point where surgery is necessary, but it, it, it can be helpful. Um, and I, you know, we have encountered situations where that is just not an option because of insurance coverage. And it, it is extremely frustrating, you know, as a, as a medical provider. Uh, and, and I know that it's very difficult um, to be a patient who doesn't have access to something that has a good chance of helping. Uh, it, you know, fortunately, there's a high rate of uh, of insurance coverage in our bleeding disorders population, but that still uh, it, there are people without it. And so it, it can be quite limiting and um, uh, just as one example. Yeah. Um, and this question would be for Dr. Wheat. 
Um, when pain is escalating and causing anxiety to increase, what specifically can I do to break that cycle? That's a great question. You know, I um, will say that I think that um, Sean covered a lot of good tips and tricks um, in his presentation, but, you know, I think um, in the moment, having something to distract yourself with can be helpful. Um, so, you know, you may not have time to coordinate a Netflix party um, experience, but, you know, there's a number of things that maybe you can do if you feel like you're able to get up and go take a walk or um, even, you know, just take a deep breath. Um, I think um, if you find that that anxiety is getting uh, so difficult to manage, um, where you feel like it's impacting your ability to function, um, and by that I mean maybe you're not able to perform as you would like at work, or you're finding that it's impacting your interpersonal relationships um, with your loved ones, then that would be a great time to touch base with um, your HTC mental health provider. So probably your social worker. They, um, I know ours here um, are excellent. They have a great uh, set of resources um, and directions that they can help our patients go in. Um, and then also they um, offer some, you know, in-house consultations in the moment to um, help reduce um, that anxiety and those stressors. But that's where I'd start, um, is, is working on some of those things and, and reaching out to your, um, again, HTC mental health provider if you feel like you might need a little extra support. All right, thank you. And then one hey. last question, and we'll turn it back to Brett. Um, uh, is Sean, is now the time to start a new fitness program? Um, I think it could be. Um, I think depending on what the situation is and how much time you have. Um, but I think using this time right now can be really helpful in figuring out what, you know, first of all, what are your fitness needs? You know, what, why do you want to get more fit or how do you want to get more fit? Um, kind of figuring out what the purpose of that is and then trying to tailor a fitness protocol or workout regimen that um, meets those goals. I feel a lot of people, um, get into fitness or it's kind of an all or nothing kind of thing. And that is a really easy way to get burnt out or have some negative self-talk. Uh, you know, if you don't reach your goals within a certain amount of time, you just kind of give up. Um, or, you know, if you're doing really good all week, having good meals, healthy meals, and then you have one bad day and then you just kind of let it go for the, the week. I feel that can hop happen. I've personally done that. Um, so I think finding a, workout regimen and a diet that fits your needs and isn't too much too soon um, would be the best way to approach that. But I think uh, it's always good to try to get in shape and, you know, do that. Perfect. Thank you. Well, Brett, we're going to turn this back to you. Great. Thank you so much, Michelle. Thank you. I'd like to thank all of our panelists for uh, taking the time and uh, giving us your, uh, your expertise and we appreciate it very much. Um, I'd also like to thank um, everyone out there for joining us. We truly appreciate you joining us this week. Uh, the 2020 Bleeding Disorders Conference has gone virtual this year and will be held August 1st through August 8th. Registration is open to all families living with a bleeding disorder and is free of charge. Um, I provided a link in the chat section that will bring you to the virtual BDC homepage. If you are unable to access it, you can always go to hemophilia.org as well. Uh, please note that this recorded webinar will be available on Monday, June 15th in the COVID-19 section of, on hemophilia.org. And we thank you for joining us again. And always remember that we are here for you. Thank you, everyone. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Have a great weekend. You too. You too. Thanks, all. Bye.